Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I think we're going to get started on the next portion. Uh, my name is Sarah Buffa. As uh, Cyril said, I am finishing my PhD very shortly here in the Near Eastern Studies Department. Uh, I'm also affiliated with FPRI and uh, sorry, what? Lights. Yeah, we said we would just try and keep it on just so that we could have a video that would work in the classroom oh. as well. And that if, as the presentation went, you felt you couldn't see the slides, then I would go ahead and But that, uh, leaving all that aside, <laughs> my, my, uh, my greatest accolade is uh, that I am actually the husband of Holly as well. So that's probably more important. That's why she wants us to see it better. Yes, that's right. So it's, it's just that the lights are on. Um, <laughs> So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk more about uh, intellectual history, uh, the history of, of Islam as a religion, how it relates uh, to politics, and I will probably bring this up uh, several times throughout, um, but I want to emphasize that a lot of the things we're going to discuss here about Islam and its relation to politics, uh, we're using Islam as the example, and it's very important, but it doesn't only apply to Islam. We could, we could probably have a very similar lecture um, about Christianity or, or Judaism as well. Um, so let's get started. So why would we have this discussion about Islam and Islamism, uh, which is really a story uh, much more focused in the Middle East than it is in the West, uh, in, in a, a seminar about Islam in the West? Um, but one of the reasons is the idea of uh, religious freedom in the West, right? I just did a quick Google image search, right? And uh, brought up for some of the first images that, that came up, right? And what we see here um, is in almost all of these cases, you have a cross with Christianity, you know, the Star of David for Judaism, and then you have this, the crescent and star for, for Islam. So if you're thinking about religious freedom in the way most people do in the West, Islam is certainly falls within that category for most people, and in the West we consider uh, at least we say we consider uh, religious freedom to be an important value. Whether or not we always love that ideal is, is a different question, but at least you know it's in, it's in our self-consciousness of who we are. Now, Islamism, we could think about as as something different, right? Um, while Islam is generally falls into this protective, as a religion, consider you know, as protected by religious freedom. Islamism, just the word itself, the ism gives the idea that. Um, it's an ism, it's a, it's a political ideology, which would open itself up to, um, to more criticism, right, um, than as other political ideologies uh, would do. And we've seen, you know, I'm sure anyone's been following debates about what's going on in the Middle East. We see people trying to make arguments about what Islam is, uh, what Islamism is, what's the difference, is one perverting the other, is one a true representation of the other, uh, where does politics fall within Islam? Now, it would be really nice if I could get up here and say, oh, yes, I'm the expert, and I'm going to tell you exactly what's what. This is Islam, this is Islamism, uh, this is what Islam is, this is what it isn't. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really do that, because I don't think that's, that's, uh, that's really possible, at least for myself as a non-Muslim. A Muslim could tell you what they believe. Uh, I can't. Um, and I think that that's probably the point, actually, uh, of this lecture, uh, and uh, this this point, if I was to come across, if I was to get one idea across towards the end, it would be that um, it would be not to essentialize, not to create uh, some sort of categories in our mind of, of what uh, Islam or Islamism are, um, and uh, use those categories to make sort of political or value judgments um, moving forward. Uh, but that being said, uh, we will get we will go through. Uh, ways of discussing these topics, right? Um, the idea of what Islam is, we'll talk about different ways of discussing it. Uh, what its relationship to politics is, because that's, of course, uh, a key component of, of, uh, of any conception of, of Islamism, and, and we'll get into some of the history of these ideas and where they come from. Okay, so, like I said, we're talking about Islam, but we're really talking about religion. And a lot of what we've said here can be done with, uh, a lot of what I'm going to say here can be done to other religions as well. Uh, Judaism and Christianity, most importantly, because they are very closely related to Islam. Um, and there are different ways to think about 
religion and uh, what it is, what it means to be a Muslim, what it means to, uh, what are the parameters of Islam, then I would break it down into basically two different approaches to this topic. One is, uh, is the idea of a, a belief system or a system of practices, right? What Muslims, or in the case of Christians or, Jew, or Jews, uh, you know, their own religions, what do they, what, what do the people actually think about their religion, what do they think it is, uh, how do they practice it? Someone who calls himself a Muslim, what does he or she do, right? And in that conception you can say that all the different, anyone who believes in Islam has a right to say what their religion is, and therefore everyone has basically, it's sort of a level playing field between everybody, right? Um, a different example in textual religion, which uh, Islam is, is to look at uh, the sources. There are texts in Islam, canonical texts, uh, and some people claim to be able to read these, look into these texts, and create some sort of version of what uh, uh, Islam is. And, and the same again for other religions. So first, let's go through um, different ways of looking at uh, at religion. Right? So as belief, as a belief or a practice. Uh, you can probably be safe. You can be safe. I said you can't say what Islam is or isn't. You, you can be safe starting with, with this idea that, that Islam is a religion of Abrahamic tradition, which means it comes from Abraham, just like um, Christianity and Judaism, uh, that was re revealed through the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad in the 7th century. Right? That's a pretty safe starting point. Um, unfortunately, after that, it begins to get a bit murky uh, in every direction. Right? And there will be a lot of people who are going to tell you uh, that you know, there are certain parameters and certain things, and, and we'll discuss some of them in a second. Um, some of the main divisions and main disagreements I'm sure you've heard about, right? There are uh, Sunnis and Shi'is, right? Uh, the Sunnis, uh, much, much of the, the origin, it becomes, the differences become much greater later, but the origin of it is, is who should succeed uh, the Prophet, who should come after, right? The Sunnis believe it's just the best among the Muslims should, go, uh, should rise to leadership, and the Shi'is believe that uh, the Prophet's son-in-law and his daughter, uh, so son's of Ali and his daughter Fatima, form a, a line which, which should control. And we'll talk about some of the implications of that. Uh, but this is a division that has divided uh, the Islamic world, has divided Muslims about uh, the nature of their religion, what their religion means, what it, what, what it says. Um, but these aren't the only divisions. There are a lot more divisions than just Sunnis and Shi'is. There's another set called the Ibadis, which extra credit for anyone who can tell me where the Ibadis oh. I've been there, Oman. Oman, yes. <laughs> also in uh, so the island of Zanzibar. Did you know yeah. So yeah, Oman is, is ruled by uh, um, a sultan who is not, he's neither Sunni or Shi. He's uh, Ibadi. There's also some all the pockets of these Ibadis in North Africa, uh, and they rule the island of, of Zanzibar as well. Right? So, and within these sects, Sunnis and Shi'is, but you also have subsects. So Sunnis have four different legal schools, right, which all disagree about how to understand their religion. The Shi'is have a number of different subsects within Shi'ism about which way this lineage from the Prophet goes, and we'll, I'll show you a chart on that in a second. Um, and then you, within each sect and subsect, you also have different approaches to how to understand the religion. So you have Sufi mystics exist in many of these sects, right, which uh, their idea of how to understand what Islam is, what Islam is, uh, and the believer's relationship to uh, to God uh, is much different than um, legalists who are also exist side by side in these schools. So basically, you have different a number of different approaches to uh, what Islam is with among Muslims, right? And I'll just give you some examples of how extreme some of these different uh, disagreements can be, right? For Shi'is, this. Is, Meant to be meant to look complex. It's not meant for you to understand what this chart is. Just to show you uh, how crazy it can be, right? These are the different lineages of, of Shiism. Um, how, how different groups of Shi'is believe that succession of the Prophet uh, uh, should have been handled, right? And they all form different sects, which which often disagree, and sometimes disagree over very fundamental issues. Very fundamental issues. Um, and I'll give you just oh, good. How do the different Shia, the Shi groups, view each other according to this lineage? So some of them, uh, they, in different times, it's, it's been different, right? And oftentimes you'll see Shi's coming together in the face of a 
of a common threat, which they face throughout most time as in Sunnis. I mean, today, a great example of this is you have the 12 Rashis, which are the majority, right, um, in, in, uh, in, in the world, and they're in Iran, southern Iraq, and most of the Shis you hear about are, are 12 Rashis. But then you also have these Zaydis, right, which is, they believe, uh, it, it's a question of where, so I was going to get into this in, in a minute, and this was just meant to be an aside, but I'll, I'll just go through it briefly. Uh, in Shi'i Islam, they believe that Descent, uh, political control, and religious control of authority in the community is passed down through the Prophet's family, right? And then after the Prophet, you have a series of what they call Imams, right? Who are um, not divine, but a lot of times considered infallible. Uh, it's the difference between uh, the Sunnis who believe that the leader is just the best among people. This doesn't give them any sort of special insight, right? Versus the Shis, where you have. Uh, this is, it's almost equivalent of European um, divine right. So God wouldn't choose this Imam to be in this place if he didn't have special uh, characteristics, right? So today you have Zaydis which disagree about who this Imam was, right? And if a Zaydi got up and started saying some of these things in Iran, he'd get in trouble. But Zaydis are, are in Yemen. Uh, you might hear about this in the news: the Houthis or Zaydis, uh, and the Iranians are supporting them against what they see as as, as Sunnis. So sometimes you see these groups together. Now, some of the ideas that uh, these different sects have are, they disagree on very fundamental aspects of what Islam is, right? And this is what's important. So here you have an example, uh, there's a sect called the Alawis, which you can see in the map here, Syria, Lebanon, um, and the Levant they exist. Uh, this is the president of Syria, Bashar al-Assad, who is an Alawi, he comes from this sect. So most Muslims, would tell you that um, the Prophet Muhammad is not just a prophet, right? He's not just a prophet of God, but he is the last conduit of, of a divine message for humanity, right? After him, uh, humans basically lose touch, to this direct line uh, to the divine, right? The Alawis, the uh, name Alawi, uh, Ali, right? Um, believe that Ali, who is the prophet's son-in-law, um, cousin, has a sort of semi-divine uh, message or, or presence, um, even after Muhammad is dead, right? So here's someone after Muhammad who has a message and who can say things which are, which are considered almost on the level of, of what the prophet says. And the Alis also include other texts within their religion, in their, their canon of, of, uh, of religious texts, including uh, you know, works from Socrates and Plato. Um, these are things that many Sunni Muslims would, would reject and say this is un-Islamic. Yet yeah, here you have people, they say we're Muslims, right? Um, and they believe in these, uh, these ideas and these texts which are, and they have practices which uh, many other Muslims would say, no, 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 that's not Islam. When were those more ancient texts, pre-Muslim texts, introduced into the Allah? I'm thinking of the House of Wisdom and then they were all running around, you know, everyone translating the Greeks, but this predates that, doesn't this? That yeah, so these texts were always um, in, in the Islamic, I mean, from the very early days, right? When, when, when Islam expands out and, and it, it, it interacts with different, uh, different cultures, of course, they come up into contact in Syria um, in, in these areas with, uh, with Byzantines and Greek culture, and, and they aren't the only ones. So they, they put more emphasis on this, right? Uh, on um, on say Socrates and Plato, and a lot of those ideas have fallen out of Sunni Islam. But any Shi Ayatollah that's in Iran is going to know who Socrates is and have read uh, have read these Greek texts still. So, so it's not just the Alawis, but um, in certain in a number of uh, Islamic traditions that ex ex continue to exist today, um, these other traditions are still in there and. Is very divisive, and I guess that's the point here, right? Is is that um, some Muslims will tell, will say, no, that's not Islam. Some say it is Islam, um, and there's no real agreement about what uh, what to believe, even on some very fundamental issues, uh, such as you know, um, could Ali have given a, you know a divine message after Muhammad's death? Right. Excuse me, could you kind of compare it a little bit to Thomas Aquinas kind of bringing Greek ideas into Christianity 
and that becoming accepted in some areas, but then maybe fundamentalists wouldn't necessarily. Yeah, uh, no, it would be the exact same thing. And, and uh, you know, other other religions have had uh, have had similar. Um, you know, in, in Judaism, uh, there's a guy Philo who, who does the same who does the same thing. Um, and there aren't just in Islam. You know. Um, it's not just an interaction with Christianity. You know, there are also various uh, civilizations from Persia and from from the Indian subcontinent, and some of these ideas uh, make their way in, and they're contested, and, and different people uh, say, you know, this is Islam, this is not Islam, this is what we believe, and this is not what we believe. The point is, uh, if you ask someone what is Islam, what what do Muslims believe, it's very complicated, and um, it's very difficult to uh, to pin down. Um, what exactly these are, right? These groups are. There's also this issue of high and low uh, Islam, which is a similar uh, phenomenon that exists in other religions as well, right? I mean, you mentioned Thomas Aquinas. Um, a lot of these ideas we're talking about here are uh, debates within high Islam, debates among scholars, right? Debates among religious scholars over what Islam is or what Islam isn't. Uh, but most people who call themselves Muslims, most Muslims don't don't take part in these debates and probably uh, throughout history haven't been aware of them. Just like most Christians wouldn't be able to tell you what Thomas Aquinas uh, said or didn't say, right? So uh, it's important to remember that, especially we'll, as we get later on into the 20th century, um, and especially in, in Muslims in the West, that a lot of these debates take place and these are the texts that we have because these are the ones that survived because the peasants didn't leave anything for us. Um, but it doesn't necessarily represent what all Muslims uh, think and the way they, they saw their religion. Um, and if we're thinking about Islam as practiced or as believed, then what this peasant does and says is, is also very important. Okay, so then the other way to look at it, if we've looked at Islam as belief or as practice, where everyone basically has a say, and an equal say, and an equal right to say what their religion is, what they believe in, uh, there is another way of looking at it. Um, Islam as text, right? And in this, you could say that, okay, um, there are these holy texts, right? And if we read them and tell you, you know, and try to determine what they tell us, that's what Islam is. Do the same thing for Christianity and say, oh, well, if there's a, a right Islam to come out of this text, then someone who's a Muslim could be wrong in their beliefs, right? Uh, if you're looking at Islam as a set of practices, then you wouldn't really say this Muslim is wrong. He believes the wrong thing. But if you look at it this way, some people who look at it this way can say, yes, uh, Muslims are uh, th these Muslims are right, and these Muslims are are wrong. And in the main texts, there are many texts, but uh, the main ones are the Quran, which I'm sure everyone knows, uh, the main book. Then there are the Hadith, which are sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, which isn't on the same level as the Quran, but is, is very important, and the Sunnah of Muhammad, which is his tradition, right? Again, it comes down to this idea that God chose Muhammad to be the prophet, so he must have been doing something right. So if, if Muslims can follow his example, uh, they'll be on, on the right path. Um, so the problem, of course, is once you get into these texts, is that it's not exactly clear what the message is is always, right? And we'll get into some specifics, right? You might, depending on where you are, wh wh which, you know, cable news you watch, or which newspaper you read, you'll probably hear different things about Islam being a warlike religion or a peaceful religion. Um, and if you look in the Quran, there are, there are various examples that one could take of uh, promoting war or, or, or demanding uh, uh, peaceful relations. It's a matter of deciding which verse you're going to take, uh, and, and from what context, and and what you do with that verse, right? Um, so even if you agree on a verse, right? There's a very important verse called that uh, says, "There is no compulsion in religion," right? Uh, this is a verse in the Quran. Now, there are many ways. Even if everyone agrees that we should listen to this verse, right? That this is the verse um, we should pay attention to there are different ways of looking at that verse. Today, most Muslim scholars would say that this is an injunction. This is a telling you um, that you cannot compel people in matters of religion, right? That you cannot force someone, it's, it's, it's bad, right? Normatively bad 
uh, to try to force someone to uh, to believe something, right? To convert them, right? Forcibly convert them. Uh, but that's not the only way that verse has been understood. Um, there is also an understanding in the verse that it's not a it's not a normative statement. It's simply a statement of fact that um, there is no compulsion rules. You can't force someone. To, to do it. It's not making any judgment about whether or not you should try. It's just saying it's impossible, right? Because people are going to believe what they're going to believe. And then there's actually a third version of this, of this verse, a third interpretation, uh, which existed in probably earlier periods. You don't hear so much anymore, which was that um, this was an injunction against compelling people, uh, but it had to do with a particular battle that Muhammad had, had, had taken part in, uh, and it was in this context, this historical context that this verse was revealed, and therefore it only applies to people at this particular time. And it doesn't really apply to people later, right? So here we have a simple statement from the Quran. There's no compulsion in religion, and it's interpreted in a whole range of different ways, right? And I mean, it's really difficult to say uh, what the the you know, original uh, meaning is, um, which can make it difficult for us to say, what does Islam say about X, Y, and Z? And you have this on even some mundane issues. I mean, most people understand that Muslims don't, uh, most Muslims would, would uh, consider alcohol to be forbidden, right? Uh, but in the Quran, it's, there's a number of different uh, verses, and some of them are actually more permissive of alcohol. I mean, some are permissive of alcohol, but at certain times, not while praying, for example, you can't have alcohol. Um, and what it comes down to is there's usually a system of abrogation of, okay, verses were revealed at different times, and if um, and certain verses basically abrogate other verses, right? Now the question that different sects of Islam and different Muslims will argue about is which verse abrogates which, right? And you get a lot of that actually in uh, issues of, of war and, and, and peace, which is uh, a more serious issue, I would say. Right. So, the next we come to, uh, if we're going to think about, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. That's what I would, uh, on that same note, can you think of any very big contradictions within the Quran that really stand out, much as in the Bible or the Torah, how there are many verses that seem to contradict others about what one can do, what one can't do, what they should or shouldn't do? Yes, I mean, the, it, clearly there's there's a, a plethora uh, of, of verses. I mean, on war and peace, I, I could get you the exact verses. I'd have to look them up. But, you know, there are verses which say, you know, you need to go out and conquer the non-believers. Um, and there are verses that say, no, if, if non-believers are, are, you know, uh, are fine, and, you know, we should make peace with them if, if they want peace. And the, the, the debates that happen... Are which usually they'll be based over whether or not one verse was for a particular battle, right? They'll say, "Oh, you know, if you if you want if you want to make the argument that that uh, Islam is a religion of peace, you can say that the, the warlike the warlike uh, verses are, aren't universal. They're, they're for a certain period of time, right? Uh, if you want, and you make the exact opposite, uh, which you'll see all over the place in, in very polemical writings." Or on different news channels, or you know, American politicians trying to make a different statement uh, about what, what Islam is or isn't. Um, you, you'll see them, them them try to do this, right? Um, so a lot of these debates over the the wide range of what Islam is or or isn't uh, carry over into uh, politics, which is very important if we're going to discuss uh, Islamism later, right? So Muhammad is. Uh, it should be stated clearly is he was a political leader, not just a religious leader, right? He was the head of a, of a state, of a, of a polity um, in, in, in Arabia, uh, and made you know, political judgments uh, as well as, as uh, religious, uh, religious judgments, right, among, among uh, the people, right? In a way that, say, Christianity sort, sort of, you know, Jesus did do that, right? Jesus wasn't, wasn't ever the head of the state. Um, so, once Muhammad dies, though, it becomes unclear uh, where the Muslim community should go, right? Muhammad has, uh, we talked about a little bit about his, his 
successors, when we're talking about differences between uh, Sunnis and, and, and Shis, and they disagree, the, the two sides disagree, not only over uh, who his successors should be, the Sunnis think that it's uh, just the best among Muslims, right, and uh, they elect a man named uh, Abu Bakr, and the Shi'is believe no, it has to go through this line. But as I said, there are implications to this beyond simply who rules. It, it's really about um, about what the nature of that rule is. Is this a divine right by uh, a God chosen ruler who is infallible, which the Shi'is would, would argue, or is this simply uh, the first among equals, right? Among uh, which is what the, the Sunnis would, would argue, um, and therefore you there. You know, we'll get to it in a second, but there are implications to that, right? Um, so, many of these debates carry over into when we start looking at the Quran and we start looking at different political uh, implications of, uh, of early Islamic texts and how Muslims um, deal with these, right? Probably the most significant, politically significant verse from the Quran is 459. It says, Obey God, obey the Messenger, and those who possess authority among you, right? So the first part of this, is, the first two parts are, are quite clear. You know, obey Prophet Muhammad, you know, obey God, right? But the big question comes up in the third part, right? Who are those among you who have authority that the Quran is uh, is demanding that you obey, right? But the Shi'is, this question is quite simple. Uh, it's, it's, it's Ali and his successors after Muhammad, right? It's, it's the Imams, right? Uh, eventually, the last, so as I as we went to that chart before, right, and they all end at different in different places. Most Shi'is, I wouldn't say all, because uh, it's not true with all of them, but but most Shi'is believe that uh, eventually an Imam went into hiding, right? He, dis he sort of disappeared, um, and he will come back as a messianic figure. He's not dead. He's simply in a, what, what's called you know a state of occultation, uh, and he will return as a messianic figure. And this Imam who is in hiding. Uh, remains the one who possesses authority, right? Both religious and uh, political authority. For the Sunnis, the question is, is much more difficult, right? Um, and in early, the first few centuries um, of after the Prophet Muhammad's death, there are a number of Sunni scholars with come up, which come up, we come up with a number of different ideas of who are those. Uh, an authority that the Quran is insisting that you you obey, right? And here is a list of, of uh, seven of the main ones, right? This comes from a, uh, an Islamic scholar named Pabali, uh, who's given commentary on this verse, right? But it's ranged from anything from princes to military commanders to sultans to different types of scholars, people who you know are just knowledgeable or uh, legal scholars, or to just the elites of society. Uh, as well, right? And of course there are debates over, does this mean for all time, which most people think, or is this uh, tied to a very particular uh, period, right? So at the very early ages, the very early stages of Islam, the first few centuries, you have the idea of political authority amongst the Sunnis, which should be mentioned are the majority of Muslims, right? And most places and in most times uh, the Sunnis are, are ruling. There is no clear idea of what political authority should look like, who it should be, who as a Muslim you should uh, you should listen to. This changes though uh, quite quickly because while the Sunnis believed that the best among them should rule, uh, that's not really in practice what happened after the first generation. After the first generation, you basically get into uh, dynasties, right? One, somebody gets control and instead of letting the next generation, the next uh, you know, successor be whoever is best among them, he makes sure that his son or his nephew or someone in his family is going to be uh, the leader. And what sets in really, you know, 100 years, within 100 years after the Prophet's death among the Sunnis, which are the majority uh, in most places, uh, is, is a type of dynasties, right? And the, the political theology of Sunnis adopts to this adapts to this reality. And what you have really in the Middle Ages, which what, what becomes orthodox uh, Sunni approaches to political authority and politics is, a, is, a, is quietism, right? Uh, here are the two probably most famous medieval scholars, Al-Ghazali and 
the water beat, and they, uh, I mean, they really do more than anybody else to define what Orthodox uh, Sunni Islam is, and they both argue that, I mean, there's this famous uh, quote, it's, it's, it's not really from the prophet, but sometimes it's a tribute to him, it's, you know, a thousand days of tyranny are better than one day of anarchy, right? So we should just not mess things up. Even if it's bad, it's going to be much worse if we overthrow uh, the king. Also, when they start speaking about uh, those who possess authority among you, which comes from this Quranic verse, uh, all those variety of different options are gone, right? It's just one thing. Those who possess authority among you are the religious, I mean, are the political leaders, right? So it's a, they argue that the 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 Quran is telling Muslims that they must listen to uh, the political leaders. Now, there are some very extreme cases of this, even sort of um, in the Russian Empire, for example, uh, much later, but before the, the modern period, you know, they ruled parts of Central Asia where there were Muslim populations, and there are religious scholars who are using the same line of reasoning and saying that we need to, uh, that the czar is actually a legitimate Islamic political leader because he's letting us practice our um, our faith openly, uh, which is I mean, sort of the radical end of, of this quietism. Now, this isn't this is the majority position. This is semi consensus, but it's not absolute. There are other people that come through. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah was mentioned in uh, the last lecture. There's also Ibn Abdul Wahhab, who is a 18th century um, scholar from Arabia who would disagree with, with this interpretation and, and do have a, um, a more activist political uh, approach. But it's fair to say that they are in uh, the minority uh, among Muslims. And again, I mean, I have here at the bottom again, high and low Islam. It's important to remember again that many of these debates and these ideas uh, are taking place at a very high level. They're taking place in seminaries and they're taking place in uh, you know, uh, royal courts. They're not taking place among peasants in, in, in the field. At least, we don't know if they, they were uh, or were not, right? So, this brings us up into the modern period, right? And we're going to start talking about Islamism, right? What is Islamism in the context of, of, of what we've just heard about Islam and, and Islam and politics. So, with the onset of modernity, um, we see a type of mass politics emerge, just like we did in Europe. <coughs> we see the same thing emerge in the Middle East and the Islamic world. What that means is dynasties, rulers, which had ruled in the name of a family, really, I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? The, they'll talk about Islam, but really the Ottomans are the Ottoman family, and, that, and that's the, the, the line that they're ruling. Uh, that doesn't, it begins not to work so well in the modern period, and uh, they need to rule in the name of the people to have some sort of legitimacy. The question, of course, is who are these people that we're ruling in the name of, right? That they need to rule in the name of. Um, in Egypt, which is where Islamism basically uh, has its roots, was also the cent center in the late, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century of a lot of these debates. It was a sort of intellectual hub of the Middle East and the Islamic world uh, at large. There were debates over, are the people Egyptian? Are these, is this uh, an Egyptian people that, that we should rule in the name of? Is it an Arab people? You see that a little bit less in Egypt, but it comes much later, uh, certainly, you know, uh, where there should be a unified, uh, like a type of Arab nationalism, right? Ruling in the name of, of, of Arabs. Um, there's also some socialists who will make these arguments in, in, in the context of class. Uh, and then there are Islamists, right? Islamists they basically start off by s saying, no, we're not, we are Egyptians, we are Arabs, but more than anything else, we are Muslims first, right? Uh, and, and that's what we are before we are anything else. Um, I mean, a picture here, Hassan al -Bana. Uh, is an Egyptian. He forms um, the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928 as the first, probably, is what you would call Islamist uh, party. And this focus on Islam also um, brings in, you know, a focus on piety, even on, on fundamentalism. 
And it is part of this movement of, of mass politics. It comes out of this movement of mass politics, which in many uh, ways is also anti-colonial, right? Uh, Egypt at this time is under, uh, it's, a, it's a British colony, and um, these movements of mass politics are, are generally trying to throw off this, uh, this British yoke. Um, and Hassan al does this, when he's talk because he does this through the lens of Islam, it will become Islamism, uh, he makes his argument saying that uh, the secularism and liberalism that's coming in with these colonizers is, is particularly Christian, right? Where the Christians can separate religion and politics. Um, this is a European idea. It's not something that fits Islam because the Prophet Muhammad uh, was a unitary, you know, he unified, um, he unified religion and politics in a way that wasn't done in the Christian world. Uh, whether or not this is true or not is, is something else, but this is certainly what uh, Islamists like, uh, like Obama said. Um, now, Obama takes the mantle of Islam, but it's important to, to, to know that, or to point out that he was one of many political uh, leaders and one of many political ideologies, all of which uh, were made up of Muslims, right? So. Uh, there are Arab nationalists and Egyptian nationalists and socialists and, and a whole range of other political ideologies who, and these people also consider themselves uh, Muslims and, and good Muslims, but disagreed uh, with the Islamists, right? Um, so even though Obama will say this is Islam, uh, this is the only form of Islam really, it will, uh, there was no agreement among Muslims that that was the case. Right? So Islamism develops over the 20th century. Uh, it spreads out, but really Egypt remains the, the hub of, of, of the ideas. Um, and the next generation after Bada, uh, Mal Abdel Nasser, is an Egyptian colonel, leads a coup in 1952, right? And although they worked with the Muslim Brotherhood at first, they clash with them after they come to power, right? And he cracks down on any opposition, including the Islamists, and puts many of them in jail, and kills them, and tortures them, he does all sorts of bad things to them. Right. Um, this is Said Kutu behind behind prison walls. Right. Um, and behind prison walls, things start to develop. Uh, Islamism takes uh, a sort of radical turn. I was just say sections of it. Some of it, some some Islamists, you know, remain true to Bana or even go the other direction. But uh, others think, like Said Kutu here, begin to formulate new ideas. Um, they say, well, this old version of Islamism doesn't, didn't work, look where we ended up. So they begin to talk about people like Nasser uh, as being un-Islamic, right? And they, they, they formulate political ideas about uh, what constitutes a legitimate polity, uh, a legitimate Islamic polity, right? And they say that anything that's not Islamist is basically illegitimate, right? And Kutu, that's Kutu's big idea. And this idea spreads out. Uh, there are other people that follow in his footsteps and take his ideas and expand on them and argue, well, uh, because Islam is a political system, anybody, anybody who's not living within the legitimate Islamic political system is therefore not really a Muslim. Uh, and therefore, anybody who's living in a non-Islamist political system is not really a Muslim. They are an apostate, and therefore they can be killed. Um, or apostasy, which is where you get a lot of these sort of radical movements today, like the Islamic State, uh, simply killing people. That's that's the argument. Uh, kind of comes back to to this, right? But again, it's not all Islamists who go in these directions. Uh, some of them uh, kind of stay with Bana's ideas. Uh, some of them even become uh, more liberal than Bana. And these Islamists don't represent all Muslims. Um, there are different political ideologies, and still, even in this period, even in the 20th century, it's pretty fair to say that most uh, most Muslims probably didn't pay too much attention to these sort of debates. They were working in their factory or in the field, and if they had free time, they were playing soccer, you know, just like Americans would be today, right? Um, but again, these are, uh, so Islamism is much different than this, even though these are Sunnis, it's, a, it's very much a break with the, the political quietism that, that uh, defined pre-modern 
uh, Islamic politics among Sunnis. Uh, among Shis, there is a very similar transition, but it's sort of different. As uh, I mentioned earlier, the, the Shis believe that those who possess authority are these Shi Imams, right? The Imam who's in hiding. And for in Iran, where is sort of the heart of, of Shiism uh, in the modern period, the last Imam is the 12th Imam, goes into hiding, right? He's going to come back. And until then, there's no, really no legitimate political system out there, right? Um, so you can have kings or, or princes or, or sultans or, or whatever you want. None of it's, a, they're equally illegitimate and you know, you just have to deal with it until the Imam comes back. Um, Ayatollah Khomeini, who leads the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, uh, he's influenced a little bit by, you know, he says by some, some extent, by the different Islamist uh, tides that are, that are moving through the Sunni world, right? Um, and you see, like, for example, in Iran, they had, like, they had a postage stamp on site, Qutub, even though he was a Sunni, and they have you know, streets named after him. So um, there is some, even though it's, it's independent. Um, and what Khomeini argues is that, yes, the uh, Imams certainly have, uh, they're, they're the ones who are, uh, possess political authority or any type of authority, religious and political, political authority when they're around. But when he went into hiding, the scholars became the most, uh, those who possess uh, political authority. And this is, so this reinterpretation of this verse 459 uh, from the Quran is, is new for, for Shi'is, but uh, it, it gains a lot, of, uh, a lot of support. And after the Islamic Revolution, the Iranians are really able to even impose it um, by uh, the state power. Um, but again, not all Shi'is recognize. Right, there are still a lot of Shi'is who say no. The Imams are still the, you know, they're still the ones with authority, not the religious scholars. But in Iran, when Khomeini takes over, uh, the religious scholars claim that they are the ones who have uh, authority, and therefore they should form a state, which they do, and they impose uh, Islamic law, or what they, you know, what they view as as uh, Islamic law. Uh, but again, like their Sunni. Like their Sunni uh, counterparts, it's it's not it's not a, when they create an Islamic state, they're not just simply taking uh, from the past and bringing it and bringing it forward, right? I mean, this is an Islamic republic, right? The idea of a republic, right? With the constitution, um, so the, it's it's basically it's, it's a modern political ideology mixed with uh, with Islam and and, and uh, confined, uh, you know, and, and justified. Now, with, with both these Sunnis and Shi. Islamism, and these Islamist parties, and even self-identified Islamist parties, they will not say that they are uh, Islamists in a way that that is something different than Islam, right? The, the, the idea is simply that uh, they are representing what is true Islam, and, you know, people who disagree with them are wrong uh, about what Islam is, not about what Islamism is. Now, the issue that you have, of course, is when if you think back to the beginning of, of uh, speaking about what Islam is or isn't, it's very difficult to know, right? It's very difficult to say. And there, there are many different competing views of what uh, Islam is or isn't. And if you look at a text, uh, Islamic text, you're not going to come across, come, come away with it uh, with a clear, you know, view that, that cannot be contested, right? And again, this is not just Islam. It would be the same with, you know, Christian fundamentalism today or uh, even, you know, Judaism and Zionism, uh, you know, you have different groups who look at the same text and, and come away with very different um, ideas. So I don't want to delegitimize these Islamist ideas by saying that they are, are, are something new, uh, but it's important to keep this sort of wide range of possibilities of what Islam is, right? Uh, and how it, it's different from Islamism. It's not really as clear um, to say, right? Because you would have some people would say uh, different versions of Islamism. Some of them are closer to uh, liberal versions. Some of them are very extreme, like uh, the Islamic State, right? And then you have this hazy area in the middle where people sort of recognize that Islam has a political role, but they differ very 
significantly from what the Islamists say. You have people who look at the Islamic text and say, no, there's a liberal version of Islam in there, and Islam should be tolerant and uh, you know, pro-Western. You get this from Muslims in the West saying that, for example, in, in the United States, you have Islamic scholars saying that the U.S. Constitution actually uh, represents uh, the embodiment of Islamic values. And you have Islamists, on the other hand, um, saying that, so they'll say Islam does have a very political role, but it's, it's something very different than the anti-colonial, anti-liberal uh, politics that typified um, what Islamism is. Um, and these debates continue to go, and the, and the borders between them are very blurry, right? Um, and I guess the thing I'm trying to get across if I was to get across anything is when we're talking about Muslims in the West, right? Uh, and the debates that Muslims in the West are having, or the debates that uh, non-Muslims in the West are having about what's going on in the Middle East. You will see, um, first of all, you, you will see, uh, and probably like is the case throughout history, uh, most Muslims aren't participating in these debates. They're simply going about their their lives and they're living like normal, you know, Western uh, citizens, and you have other groups, I mean, I'd say probably a minority um, of people who self-identify as Islamist, um, but who are not going about their daily lives. Uh, and and worrying. they are involved in these debates, and they probably have a larger voice, even though they might not represent uh, a majority, right? Um, but in the end, when this is basically my last, my last point would be that when we're looking at what's happening around the world, or we're looking at our fellow citizens who happen to be, uh, to be Muslims, we can't assume that they believe uh, one version or the other. Um, or if we're looking at you know, even radical groups in, in the Middle East, I don't think it's so helpful to argue that, they, uh, that this one practices true Islam or this one doesn't practice true Islam. Uh, the story is, is very complicated. The relations with, you know, and, and unclear and ambiguous, and the relations uh, between Islam and politics are, are very, uh, can be quite unclear and ambiguous, and throughout history they've been interpreted by different, very authoritative figures in, uh, in very different ways, and while these very authoritative figures were interpreting these things, uh, most Muslims simply went on with their, with their daily lives uh, and didn't involve themselves uh, with that. Um, so, I know it's a bit conf probably confused you more than uh, I've shed light on what these different categories are, uh, but I think that is probably the point, um, and I would hope that that's actually um, a good thing. Um, so, I think we have time for questions. Is there anyone has any? I was sort of wondering, and this might relate with both of the, the discussions this morning, um, about when Islam goes from a regional religion to a worldwide religion that's that's aware that it's a worldwide religion. I mean, I was struck with the, the Al-Jahari uh, article earlier talking about he was not aware of um, you know the impact of, of Muslims in the East Indies, and yet you know there had been instances before where, like uh, you know, Africans might you know will go to uh, to do the Hajj and 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 go there, so people would have seen them. But when do we get to a point where instead of it being very regionalized, that you have this image that that Islam seems to have today of a worldwide religion that's that's impacting people on all continents and not just focused on one particular area of the world. Um, so I would say it probably goes through stages. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that there's clearly, you know, I wouldn't put this, I wouldn't divide it, I guess, in that way, right? I guess if you were to put it very early on, it's a religion of Arabs. I mean, the first, like, you know, talking the first you know, 10 or 20 years or whatever, in Muhammad's lifetime, it's certainly an, an Arab focused religion. And as they expand out um, into other non-Arab parts of the world, this is really like in the first you know, 50 years, um, they have to deal with non-Arabs who are, or are now going to become uh, Muslims, right? 
Um, and this is a process which isn't so, uh, so clear, but as they take on, especially in two areas, right, up in, up in uh, Syria, right, where they run into Byzantine culture, and in Iran, in Persia, where they run into Persian uh, culture, they begin to adopt these ideas. And there is uh, about being uni truly universal. But there's still this undercurrent of Arab, Arabism uh, in Islam, right, uh, especially among the Arabs. Um, so there's this idea that they begin to think about themselves in universal terms, right? Now, in the first, you know, few hundred years, there's or not even a few hundred, but yeah, I guess you could say the first couple hundred years, there is a unified Arab empire, right? It switches from the Umayyads, the Basids, um, and in this sense, they have, they always view themselves as universal, right? From, from when they're in these empires, they they, unify, they, they understood themselves as as very uh, universal empire, even though they were contained to certain geographical areas. The point was that eventually everyone would see the light, and uh, it's just kind of like how Christianity views itself, uh, you know, but without the political borders. Um, that eventually everyone will become Muslim, right? Um, so then the problem is that you have these empires sort of break down. They expand out, and different first different centers of the empire uh, rise up, and then they become their own dynasties, which are separate, right? And then you have these, you know, there's still the idea of universal, and many of these, within each of these, you know, uh, different kingdoms or sultanates or empires, uh, the people view that one as the Islamic empire, but there are different ones. And they might not be, they'll be aware uh, to more or less extent of, sometimes to a much lesser extent, of what's going on in these other far-flung areas which consider themselves um, Muslims, and this is further, I, I would say, uh, skewed by. In the early years, you have imperial conquest, right? Uh, what comes after that, especially in places like Africa and in um, and in Southeast Asia, is you have Sufi mystics who are traveling around. They're on trade routes, and they are talking to people, and they are converting them to Islam outside of this political context of. Of the empire, so what we talked about, you know, out in Malaysia or Indonesia, you might have people converting to Islam, but outside the context of a major empire. So it wouldn't be in the center, you know, the Middle East. They might not be so aware of what's happening uh, among these mystics on these trade routes. Uh, just that Muslims are starting to to um, appear, and then there's finally, um, I would say, in the modern, in really in the 20th century. Uh, you, you you see the breakdown of this idea. There was always an idea that Muslims should live within a Muslim society, right? Um, and this had been around from the very beginning. And uh, for example, many Islamic scholars would argue that when the Ottomans would lose, for example, the Ottomans, it could have been any of these empires, if they were to lose territory, the Muslims that live in the territory that's lost need to leave that territory and go back to live in, uh, in within the Muslim Empire, right? Now, this didn't always happen, but that was the debates of high Islam, right? What, what should be done in an ideal state? And there was a division, even though everyone recognized that the whole world would eventually be Muslim, there was a division of the world between Islamic and non-Islamic uh, areas. In the 20th century, you really see that break down. Um, first of all, because there's a loss of a lot of territory, and second of all, because Muslims are moving to uh, to the West, right? To and scholars basically have to come to terms with that. Uh, and there, I would say, for the first time, you really have this idea of universal, the world as, as a single entity, right? Where you can be a good Muslim anywhere, uh, even in non uh, in non Muslim controlled areas, like places like the United States. As long as you can freely practice your religion, then the whole world is is uh, you know is open to you. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Um, I was just curious, when you talk about the development of Islamism versus Islam, yeah. how much of an influence did the encroachment of Western, the Western world have on the development of it versus just the own inner turmoil and conflict amongst the different Islamic groups that were all vying for different territory, popularity, and things along those lines? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a blending 
of the two, mm -hmm. uh, for Did sure. One play like a greater role than the other, or I mean, so this gets into I mean, there's certainly a debate about that, right? And the debate really comes down to whether or not uh, Islamism is legitimately Islamic, right? Even within the Islamic world, you'll you'll have people argue, for example, in Saudi Arabia, where right now they don't really like uh, Islamists, um, and a lot of the scholars. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about Bana and Kutub as being uh, just people who basically promoted Western ideas. And this was Western politics that made its way in. So they'll try to delegitimize and say this is not Islamic um, by, by, by highlighting these ideas. And, and they did have many uh, Western ideas. As I mentioned, Bana comes, comes to, uh, you know, he comes from a school, really, which uh, is open. Uh, it's a Western secular style school, which teaches also Islam for, for school teachers, actually, because both Bana and Kutub are, are, uh, you know, are school teachers. Um, and they both go to this school, um, which sort of blends the two. It's one of the first institutions that blends the two. And many of their ideas clearly are, are coming uh, from these mo modernization projects coming out of Europe and political ideas coming out of Europe. Kutub, what he argues, when he says that this system is not Islamic, and that we need to um, that we need to, uh, the question is where do you go from there, right? He argues that you need to form a type of vanguard of Muslims who will take back the state. Where does this come from? It comes from Lenin. I mean, it's very clear. This comes right out of Lenin, right? Um, so people who want to delegitimize Islam, Islam right, or this, 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 this version of it, will point to these, these facts. Now, of course, Islamists and people who are more sympathetic to it are for some reason, want to make the argument that they are more they, they won't. They won't. Um, they won't make those. They, they won't highlight those things. They will highlight that um, many of the arguments that that Bana and Kutub made were made earlier by earlier scholars somewhere. You know, um, and Kutub and Bana will do this. I and mean, Kutub has a whole uh, exergy of the Quran, where he, he goes through the entire thing and makes a different. You know. Uh, Arguments about the different uh, verses, and he takes much of his many of his arguments from earlier arguments within from in Islam. But they are, let's say, they're selective. Um, on this 459, he argues that um, that instead of this consensus that you just have to, it's the political leader. He says it's the political leader, but only if the political leader. Um, meets certain standards of being a Muslim, which this argument existed very early in Islam, and Kutub simply revives it to meet his particular political context. So it's unclear, I think I would argue that it's unclear where this line is, and how, you know, how far uh, in either direction it goes. The important part is that when people are making these arguments, um, they are, there's usually more to it than simply they're trying to either legitimize or delegitimize this as a as a uh, as Islamic and that that's something that uh, defines Islam and that Muslims um, should follow. Okay, well I guess we uh, can just take a adjourn here and then lunch will be served in the same room at noon, so you can just uh, stretch your legs, walk around, talk amongst yourselves, and uh, then we can all have lunch together. Thank you.